Let's do some easier topics now, right? Fair value. So we'll get into fair value, um, see how you can deal with this one, and then we'll get on to IFRS 9. So they're a bit more uh, challenging topics. So fair value concepts. Yes, just speak louder. Correct. So in, in cases of exports, when uh, we are shipping to ocean... What's your Inca terms? Pardon? What's your Inca terms? Which terms? The Inca terms. Okay. Um, uh, in case where uh, we are bearing the risk when the ship... FOB destination? destination. Well, I think you have to come up with an e estimate. If it's impractical, I was your auditor, I would accept that. I expect an estimate. So if your Inca terms are that the risk transfers at delivery point, you book the revenue delivery point. What I've seen some companies do in the U.S. is they came up with synthetic deliveries where they delivered it at, at, uh, at shipping point, but they got it insured and they, they became an agent for the customer. This is how they did their paperwork. So effectively, um, they structured it in such a way they booked the revenue at shipping point, but the customer had no difference because you were basically the customer's agent. So if something went wrong, the insurance would reimburse you. So that was a, I saw, I've seen synthetic shipping terms to get around that rule. Do you follow me there? But if, you're shipping, if it's a standard black and white shipping term, where the risk transfers at destination, the revenue is booked at destination. And that can be a big impact where the ships take many, many months. So the client I had was a company that made the, the scissor forklifts. It was a U.S. GAP client. And they actually, went, they actually restructured with their auditors the INCO terms to be everything at shipping point with the, with the insurance. And they were the agent for their customers to collect if something went wrong on the shipment. So from the customer's perspective, they didn't have any risk until the goods arrived. The, the risk was transferred to the insurance. They were basically uh, agents uh, uh, from the insurance point of view. Correct. So then it became FOB shipping point. That's what they did. Any other questions up to there? All right, get on to fair value. So this was based on U.S. GAAP, and the idea of IFRS 13 is to get a fair value of anything. All right? So the purpose of this standard is to get a fair value of anything. Now, some accounting standards limit when you can get a fair value, and some do not. So, for example, if you look at IAS 40, investment property, you can only get the fair value if it's reliable. But if you look at IFRS 9, you have to get the fair value of an equity instrument. But if you look at IS 39, you do not. Remember in IS 39, we had a concept of reliable, and if it wasn't reliable, you, you, used, you used cost. That's removed. So IFRS 13 is a framework to get a fair value of anything. The scope of IFRS 13 is determined by IFRS 9, IS 16, IS 40, the different accounting standards. A couple of concepts here. It's an exit price. It's not an entry price. So it's a price to sell, not a price to buy. So when you have the bid-ask spread, you can use depends if you're selling or buying, the bid or the ask price or a mid-market price. But if there's any selling cost, they must be excluded. There's a concept of an orderly transaction. It was interesting, if you go back to 08, 2008, when we had the GFC, the global financial crisis, it was very difficult to get fair values because a lot of things, there were no, mar there were no transactions. So 
One of the things, and there was actually a standard that came out in US GAAP on an orderly transaction. What do you do if there are none? So the standard is very clear that you don't use forced sales as reference points. If you go back to Dubai in 2009 and you went to the airport, you would see a lot of brand new cars at the airport with the keys inside. You know? You know why? Because if you don't pay your bill, you go to jail in Dubai. That's their legal system. So all of the probably people from Pakistan, the U.S., all these different, all the expats, you don't want to end up in a jail in Dubai, right? So if you owe money there, you got the heck out of there. So obviously, if you're in a financial distress situation and you sell for a low price, that is not an indicator of fair value. Interestingly enough, the U.S. Get, U.S. came out with guidance what to do. IFRS does not, but the principle is we don't use a forced sale as a reference point between market participants, current conditions, and at the measurement date. Now, we use the characteristics of the asset or liability. That affects... Yes? What it says in the standard is an orderly transaction is not... No, I'm not saying that. You can't use a forced sell as a reference point. You've got to be cautious. So if you're in a depressed market, what we're saying is you want to find transactions as reference points that where there's sufficient time to match buyers and sellers, they're not a distress sale. So, the, so if a normal selling period takes 90 days and there's a sale that happened in, in one day because the guy was going to go to jail at a very low price, that's not an indicator of fair value. That's the point. Remember, this is a principle-based standard. It's a very difficult standard to do with some aspects because it is arbitrary. Now, you use the characteristics of the asset or liability. So, would you consider transportation to be included in the calculation of fair value? Transportation. Is it a characteristic of the asset? We have yes and no, and is there a maybe? If I'm supposed to deliver it, yes. Okay, so what we're saying here is if the characteristic of the asset is part of the transportation, then that would affect its fair value. Yeah. Otherwise, it would not. So does transportation, is that a characteristic of an asset's value? It depends. It depends. If I have a barrel of oil, and the oil is in Sudan, and I have a barrel of oil in New York, are they worth the same? No. Location matters, right? So if location is a characteristic of the asset, then transportation to get the asset to the market is part of fair value. If it's transportation within your local market, just to move it between customers, the answer is no. Um, transaction costs are never a characteristic of the asset. They're a characteristic of the transaction. So transaction costs are always expensed. Transportation costs, it's a maybe. If location impacts the asset's value, then the transportation costs is part of the asset's value because if the market is in New York, the oil's in Sudan, you've got to get it to the market. There's obviously a value difference based on location. Well, if the if the market is in New York and it sells for 100 in New York and the oil's in Sudan and it costs 20 dollars to go to New York, you would say the fair value is 80. I don't think so, because the performance obligation is just the... Uh, Delivery of oil? Probably, yeah. 
have to think about that for a second. So, yeah, it's one performance obligation. The transportation is a is, is an SGNA, is a distribution cost. No. No. So, um, a couple of quick things. I'll do, I won't do all of these, but if we do the first one here. So, this is like Mark Zuckerberg, the first one there. So, when Mark Zuckerberg took Facebook public, the way it works is he was not allowed to sell his shares for three years. That's called restricted stock. So, you would say restricted stock, um, his shares are legally restricted. If you have shares that are not restricted and your shares can be sold on the exchange, your share is better. Obviously, Mark has more shares than you, right? But the shares that you have, those shares are better. You just don't have very many of them compared to Mark, right? So that would be a characteristic of the asset. Make sense? It impacts value. If we hold a share and we agree with another party not to sell it, that is not a characteristic of an asset. That's a deal that we have. That doesn't affect fair value. You have a piece of land. The third one there. Let's we'll do the last one there, uh, number four. Piece of land and there's an electrical wire on top of it. Obviously, if you have power cables on your land, that's, that's not as nice as if you don't. That is a characteristic of the asset. So, we take into account if it's a characteristic of the asset, it impacts the asset's value. So, transportation cost, if location impacts value, transaction cost, no. Because that's the characteristic of the transaction, not the asset. All right? Early transaction, um, again, we're looking at two things, adequate market exposure, and we're looking at market, market participants motivated, and they're not in a forced situation. Again, this is the concept, but what do you do when all your transactions are a forced sale? And IFRS doesn't have guidance on that. In markets like yours, if you want to value land in remote areas, it's probably very difficult to sell, I would presume, right? Yes. And there might be no transactions. Or the transactions might be because someone's in a financial state of distress. So we have to... And the standards that give a lot of guidance on that. So just because uh, there's some transactions at a low price, IFRS 13 says that's not the fair value necessarily. So the more difficult they are to value, the more disclosures are going to be required. Clear up to here? Let's get to the hierarchy. So we have a fair value hierarchy, as you probably, as you should know by now. And the purpose of the hierarchy is for disclosure. So in IFRS 7, we disclose the hierarchy. The argument is, the higher up you are, the more trustworthy. The lower you level you go, the less you trust it. That's the concept. When I did work with Asian Development Bank a few years ago, um, they, their emphasis was we don't want to have assets at level three because that indicates a risk and it could impact our AAA credit rating. So if you're an investment house, you might be concerned if you have too many assets at level three and if you have a AAA rating, you'll probably find you could get downgraded. So most companies that have the perfect credit ratings are very conscientious of the mix of level one, level two, level three. If you're not at the top tier level, you probably don't care as much. Because the reality is you could probably make more money in level three assets, right? So it depends on where you are. So the idea is the disclosure requirements. So the idea is level one is simply saying there's an exact price of the asset on the market. So, if a share is on the stock exchange, is it level one? Yes. Why? Yes. 
Do you agree with him? Do you work for the bank? Do you agree with him? Oh, okay. Do you agree with him then? But on the stock market. So just because you're on the stock market doesn't mean it's level one. I don't remember today, but I remember when I was here six years ago at HBL, I did some stuff. I think on the, maybe in the numbers have changed, but you used to have about 200 shares on the stock market. Has it changed? It's around 450. 450, okay. Five years ago or six years ago, it was about 200 shares. And of the 200 shares, it seemed to me from when we did the analysis, there was only like 20 or 30 shares that had an active market. There were a number of shares on the exchange that might trade once a week, once a month, once a quarter. So that doesn't, that doesn't mean there's an active market. So just because it's on the stock exchange doesn't mean it's level one. Level one would be those companies that have a sufficient volume of activity, they trade all the time on a daily basis, that would be level one. If it doesn't have sufficient volume, then it cannot be level one. So what happened in Kuwait is at the end of the year, what the wealthy families would do is they would sell some of their shares to a friend. So I have, say, 5 million shares of a company. I would sell 100 shares on the market because there's very few transactions, and you would buy it at a high price. They would use that price to say, okay, it's time to value our shares per IFRS. The share price is 100. I have 5 million shares. There's the value. In America, we call it fraud. There they call it business, right? That doesn't count. So if you, you cannot use the year in share price unless there is enough activity for the share price to demonstrate that that is the market. In US GAAP, they talk about a reference to the breadth and depth of the NASDAQ. So the NASDAQ liquidity requirements is a reference point in US GAAP literature. That reference doesn't exist in IFRS, but most shares that are OTC over the counter that don't trade that often would not probably qualify as an active market. If it doesn't have an active market, then it's either level two or level three. And the difference between level two and level three is all about the observability of the inputs. If inputs can be observed, it's level two. And if inputs cannot be observed, it's level three. So let's just do a quick question on this. If you go to the handouts, the first question there on fair value, this is one of my old exam questions that nobody liked. So is this level one, level two, level three, and it's not level four, I'll tell you that. This should be easy for you guys, right? This should be an easy one for you. So I'll ask you last. 